Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good evening. And uh, we're going to be continuing these studies on uh, A.T. Jones' 1893 General Conference Bulletins. We're about halfway through his 14th sermon, and there's going to be 10 more. So we've been taking our time going through this, and, and, and I'm going to go through all of the 1893 General Conference Bulletins, uh, Sermons of Jones. Um, then we're going to go in other directions later on. But anyway, for now, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the Sabbath, uh, for the fellowship that we can have with one another, even though we are far apart. We know that our hearts are united through thy spirit, through thy son, uh, the true unity that comes from obeying your voice and walking with you. And so, Lord, we pray that the time we spend here uh, this evening will be a blessing to each person. To those who are watching it later on YouTube, we ask, Lord, that your spirit can be with them. And... Um, we know, Lord, there's still much that we do not understand, that our, our thoughts are not your thoughts, our ways are not your ways. But we know that as we yoke up with Christ, that we can um, experience a knowledge, a wisdom that is beyond human uh, comprehension, and that we can reflect your character. And so we ask for your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and our minds and, and to unite each one. Be with us now as we open your word through um, the sermon done by A.T. Jones. And uh, help us to understand these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, happy Sabbath. Now, Jones had um, in, in our study last Friday. So now we only have these studies Fridays. We don't have them on Sabbath afternoons anymore because we have Sunday afternoon studies on the lines simply presented. But um, so it's going to take us a little bit longer to get through uh, the 1893 General Conference Bulletin. But anyway, in this, this number 14, Jones had... Um, addressed, and he's still going to address, the idea of what justification is, uh, Christ's um, imputed righteousness. But even in that, Jones does, does not consider this, this extreme separation of justification and sanctification. That is, you cannot have justification without a sanctifying work. He doesn't really say it that way, but you'll see as we go through this uh, what he says about it. Now we know that sanctification is this continual justification and it's, it's a growing in grace in the character of Christ. Um, but some people have this idea that justification is just kind of this one thing. It's just this imputed righteousness of Christ and sanctification is just this imparted righteousness of Christ. But Christ doesn't just in, um, impute righteousness. You, you can't have that without him giving us his righteousness, that there is a change made in the life, even at justification. It's just not a completed work. It's, it's, it's an ongoing process, which is called sanctification. So there isn't just this one saved, always saved one day. You just give your heart to God, you know, confess with your lips and believe in your heart, and you are saved. Of course, the scripture doesn't say that. It says you shall be saved and placing that into the future. So if we make a profession of faith uh, and we wander away from God, we're lost. There isn't a once saved, always saved idea. So he's just talking here about, um, he's going to quote Spirit of Prophecy again. If you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you are counted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character, and you are accepted before God just as if you had not sinned. 
So Jones goes on, yes, sir, you and I, and we have done that. You and I stand before God, just as though we have never committed a sin in this world, just as though we had been angels all the time. Brethren, God is good. He is good. Oh, our Savior is a wonderful Savior. Congregation says amen. Brethren, that is so. And let us and let us let him have his own way. More than this, could there be any more, think ye? Why, the Lord says so. So more than this, this is uh, quoting Spirit of Prophecy. Could there be any more, think ye? Why, the Lord says so. More than this, Christ changes the heart. He abides in your heart by faith. So there isn't just this imputed righteousness. There's a work that goes on, a work of conversion, the changing of the heart. He abides in your heart by faith. So Joan says, this is the blessedness of it. What good would eternal life do me with such a heart? Oh, he does not stop at that. He changes the heart. Ellen White says, you are to maintain this connection with Christ by faith and the continual surrender of your will to him. Jones goes on, that is the thought we had last night. It is the same lesson right along and more spirit of prophecy. And so long as you do this, he will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So you may say, and so Jones interjects here, you may say, God has given us permission to say. He has told us that we may say. Um, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So Jesus said to his disciples, it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your Father which speaketh. Then with Christ working in you, you will manifest the same spirit and do the same works. So he's quoting here directly from Sister White. And now this, we, we address this flesh. That is, we know that we have um, a fallen sinful nature. This is in Romans 7 and, and 8 that we talk about. So now we live in the flesh, but we are not of the flesh. That is, if we live by the faith of the Son of God, we now live in the spirit, right? So God's spirit has to take over our flesh. We have to have the mind of Christ, not the mind of the flesh. So, so Ellen White's quoting part of that from Romans. But we know as Christ working in you, you will manifest the same spirit and do the same works. And this is where Adventism, for the most part, has departed from the spirit of prophecy and from the, from the scriptures is they will focus upon this idea that Christ's righteousness is Im imputed to us without any our, us having any part. That is, it's his righteousness, not our righteousness. There's nothing where we can say that this righteousness was something that we gained. You know, we, we did it through some kind of works. It's a free gift of God. But they, they balk at... This idea that we can still that we can then do the same works as Christ. But the idea is that you know Christ, he our all of our sins are taken away, we're made righteous, but that work that He wants to do in us, that's what they deny. That He doesn't save us from our sins, He saves us in our sins, which is of course not taught in the scriptures. Um, so Jones goes on, he says, you can't do otherwise. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same here in our flesh now as he was when he was here before in the flesh. So, um, so we can do the same works of righteousness, obedience. So we have nothing in ourselves of which to boast. So Ellen White's quite clear that the righteousness that we have wrought out in our lives by the work of Christ that we accept by faith is nothing that we ourselves can boast about. That righteousness doesn't come from us, even if it's manifest in our, 
or life. So Jones goes on, he says, thank the Lord. Do not begin to boost yourself up and to boast of yourself and say, I am rich now and increased in goods. Now I am wise. Now I'm all right. No, isn't that the man that will say that at such a time as that? Isn't the man that will say that at such a time as that? Isn't he the worst creature in the universe? How could he be worse? When he was entirely lost, helpless and undone, and he confessed it and said so. And then the Lord has such wonderful compassion that he gives him everything he has in the universe. And then that man stands up and begins to boast of how good he is, and how great he is. What greater reproach could be possibly put on the goodness of the Lord? No, sir. Let him that glorieth glory in the Lord. The congregation says, Amen. Let us do it then. So we have nothing in ourselves of which to boast. We have no ground for self-exaltation, again, from the spirit of prophecy. And Jones goes on. The man that takes Jesus as his, as he is, will always be humble. It makes a man humble to take Christ by faith. But if he does not take him by faith but earns it, of course he has something to boast about. Our only ground for hope is in the righteousness of Christ, imputed to us and in us. What now, suppose you? So this was, again, this quote was from the Spirit of Prophecy, our only ground for hope is the righteousness of Christ imputed in us and, and to us and in. So he stops at the word in. So then he's going to quote it again, uh, working uh, imputed to us and in that wrought by his Spirit working in and through us. So the only ground for hope is in the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, right? But that's not it. That's not all. And in that wrought by his spirit, in that righteousness wrought by his spirit, spirit working in and through us. So if the righteousness of Christ is not manifest in our flesh, if it is not working through us, wrought by his spirit then do we have ground for hope no 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 because because the hope comes from the righteousness of christ and and it really can't be imputed to us if it's not wrought by his spirit working in and through us exactly. we might think that he's imputed it to us. I mean, Christ died for all men and he wants to impute his righteousness to us. But if we don't walk with him, that righteousness will not be ours. It will not be the oh. gift given to us. And it's, it's all from Christ. So, I mean, it's ours only in that it's a gift from him, not something that we brought out in ourselves. So, um, so Jones goes on, he says, our only ground for hope is Christ's righteousness imputed to us. And this righteousness wrought in us by the Holy Spirit is the works we do, right? So he, he makes this clear that this isn't just some works that Christ does. I mean, it is, but they, it's actually wrought out in our life. Then the very next paragraph is that about the satanic belief and what genuine faith is, which we studied in previous lessons. It is all one subject. So now then, page 71, I believe this is Steps to Christ that we're reading. Um, the closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. For your vision will be clearer, and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. This is evidence that Satan's delusions have lost their power. So this idea here, is it well understood within Adventism? And so it's it's kind of a trick question. But I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. Now, why isn't it? I mean, it's it's right in Ellen White's writings. Why do people have such a difficulty uh, believing that once you become a Christian, um, Satan's delusions have been removed, and you should see yourself? more clearly 
the, the evil of your nature, the evil of who you are. I never, I never hear anything like that in sermons or Sabbath schools. And on the... so, so this is actually from uh, Steps to Christ, page sixty-four, in the, in the edition we generally use. So, um, our human nature gets in the way. Yeah, Jones had it, page seventy-one. So, well, but you would think this would be a wonderful truth to know, but I, I think the problem at least the problem that I understand it, is that we want to have a righteousness by sight. We want to see ourselves as righteous. Faith, to trust that Christ has done something in us, doesn't allow us that, that we don't fully see. And, and so we want to convince ourselves that we can see it, that we are better. And I mean, there's, there's no doubt we can see the change that God has done. I mean, we can see you know, if we were an alcoholic, we can see that we no longer drink, and that's by God's grace. And, you know, if we were involved in all kinds of other sins or things in our character, we can see that God is removed. But the closer you come to Christ, you start to realize that there is more defects than you ever imagined. That there's more things wrong with you than you could have ever seen if you had not come closer to Christ. The closer you come to the light, the more clearly you will see the defects in your character. I mean, when the light first, first shined upon us, I mean, we were in the dark corner uh, surrounded by all of this evil. And, and we could see the very obvious things. But we couldn't see those things hidden deep within us. The motives of why we acted out the way we did. And, and there's, there is an automatic change that happens, but every single thing has not just dropped away the moment we see Christ, the moment that light comes to us. Because that light that comes to us is not the full revelation of the character of Christ. At least it wasn't in my experience. Now, there is some things that I saw that now when I look back at my original experience, and I think all of you would, would say the same thing, at least I hope so, is that there was something that we saw in Christ that still is fundamental that we hold on to. That is, we see something in his character that attracts us so strongly that we're willing to continue to walk down that path. I, I, do people understand what I'm talking about? I mean, if you don't, it's fine. I mean, I'm attracted to his character, you know? Yeah. And, and, and so even though, you know, that is, that's the thing that can allow us to take up our cross daily. It's this, this joy that's set before us. I mean, it's the first th reason why we can leave that, respond to that light in the first place. That we see something in the character of Christ that's different than we imagined, different than we've seen in anyone else. We're accepted in the beloved. And, and sometimes there are people in our lives, maybe, you know, our mothers or a brother or aunt or an uncle or some friend who has also has this, that, this reminds us of, or we, they remind us of what we see when we see Christ, that there's this acceptance. And, but yet we know to some degree when we first come to Christ, I mean, I don't ever think I imagined I was perfect just because I came to Christ. I mean, I knew that I was far from Christ, but I didn't know how far. I didn't know how unchristlike I was. And so this, this statement here, you know, this is the evidence that Satan's delusions have lost their power. The, the closer you come to Jesus, because we are under a satanic delusion about ourselves. And, and that satanic delusion, I mean, it's something that we participate in. It's not like Satan did it. Um, we have the mind of Satan. We're born you know, the carnal mind is enmity with God, right? 
So <clears throat> Jones goes on, he says, what is the condition of that man then who begins to think himself pretty good and praises himself? Satan's delusion is upon him, even if he have lit, has lived with the Lord 15 or 20 years. If he now begins to think he is quite good, what is the condition of that man? He is deluded by Satan. He is under satanic delusions. That is all. There was a man that lived with Jesus Christ 30 years. And when he first began in the earliest years of his life with Christ, he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And nearly 30 years after this, near, this, near the close of his life, he said this. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom, and he goes, I was chief. The congregation says, no, am chief. No, was chief? Congregation, no, am chief. Oh, no. When he was Saul of Tarsus persecuting the saints, then he was the chief of sinners. Congregation, no, am chief. Amen. Exactly. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. When? Congregation, now. When he had lived 30 years with Jesus Christ, congregation, yes, yes, I am chief. Oh, he had such a view of the Lord Jesus, of his holiness, of his perfect purity, that when he looked at himself, considered himself as separated from Christ, he was the worst of all men. That is Christianity. That is the mind of Christ. The other is the mind of Satan. Right? So the mind of Christ says, of my own self, I can do nothing. Didn't Christ say that? Did Christ feel wretched? Can Christ say, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He can say that. Now, there's no one to deliver him. Christ had to die. But we can say that, and Christ can deliver us. Christ had to die. He was in the body of this death. If he hadn't been in the body of this death, could he have died? No. Because he was righteous. He had no... There was no way that Christ could have died, that his body could have died, if he had had a sinless body, if he had a sinless nature, right? So if Christ came in a sinless nature, he would have had a body that's not subject to death. He had to come in a sinful nature, in the body of this death. And in the body of this death, he's going to feel all the things that we feel. O wretched man that I am. But Christ never sinned. So when you have the 144,000 and their sins have been blotted out, they've been gone beforehand to judgment and have been blotted out and they can't bring them to remembrance. And probation is closed and God declared them as righteous. Are the 144,000 going to think themselves righteous? No, no, they're not. No, not by a long shot. No, they're going to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. But in doing so, the only way they can do so is to have no trust in self with only trust in God. They don't have any righteousness of their own in which to trust. They only have the righteousness of Christ in which to trust. And if the 144,000 and Christ could have, do of their own selves nothing of themselves, if their righteousness was only of God, how can any one of us claim to, to be righteous or even think of ourselves as righteous or compare ourselves with others and think that we're better than others? That's just Phariseeism. But that's where the vast majority of Adventists are. And, and really, all of us are. When I say the vast majority, I'm saying 100% really in some ways. I mean, we don't, when we look at ourselves, we should see ourselves as righteous, or as, pardon me, as unrighteous. And that is, that is 
The ones who see themselves as righteous are the Laodiceans. So do we see ourselves as righteous according to God's word? Do we see ourselves as rich, increased with goods, having need of nothing? Is that how we see ourselves according to God's word? Yeah. Right. So if God yeah. says that that's how we see ourselves, shouldn't we trust that, that God is telling the truth about us? You know, that's yeah. not somebody else who sees themselves as rich and increased with goods and has need of nothing. Because if, if, if that's only somebody else, well, then, then what do we see ourselves as? Do we really see ourselves as wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? God says why do we, we don't even know why that do we, we even need. Why do we even need Jesus, then, if we see ourselves as righteous? Yeah, and and don't we and don't we and we don't really see our true condition, do we? I mean, we think we do sometimes, because sometimes, in our experience, you know, it's impressed upon us. We get this strong conviction of sin. Now, sometimes. We're like the man who looks at a mirror and walks away forgetting what manner of man he was. That is, he compares himself to the law. Now, if you compare yourself to the law written and engraven in stones, you're going to see yourself as unrighteous. That is, the law is going to show you your sin. But does the law have power in and of itself to remove your sin? Don't we have to look at the law of liberty? And what's the difference with the law written and engraven on stones and the law written and engraven in the heart? What's the difference from the law of liberty and the law written and engraven in stones? I know I'm, I'm, I'm jumping over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and, and James chapter, I think it's chapter 1. So we have the law as a mirror, right? But the law can be a mirror that just shows us our sins. Or the law can be the law of liberty. And it's going to show us not just our sins, but God's power to forgive and transform us. And that, of course, is the looking glass vision, right? That's the revelation of Christ. That's Job. That's Isaiah. That's Daniel. It's Paul on the road to Damascus. That's John on the Isle of Patmos. So, so he's going to go on reading uh, from Steps to Christ. This is the evidence that Satan's delusions have lost their power that the vivifying, vivifying influence of the Spirit of God is arousing you, that is waking you up from your sleep, from your deathly slumber. No deep-seated love for Jesus can dwell in the heart that does not realize its own sinfulness. The soul that is transformed by the grace of Christ will admire his divine character. But if we do not see our own moral deformity, it is unmistakable evidence that we have not had a view of the beauty and excellence of Christ. The less we see to esteem in ourselves, the more we shall see to esteem in the infinite purity and loveliness of our Savior. Jones goes on, that is Christianity, brethren. Now let us go to study in the Bible for just what it says. What do you say? Brethren, we are in a fearful position here at this conference, at this meeting. It is just awful. I said that once before, but I realize it tonight more than I did then. I can't help it, brethren. I can't help it. We are in a fearful position here. Not a soul of us ever dreams what fearful destinies hang on the days that pass by here. Elder Olson says that is so. That is so, brethren, as the days go on. Is our earnestness in seeking God deepening? Is it? Is it? Or is it rather coming to a lull? 
The first lessons when we started here, they were fresh, they were new, they brought truth in strong, plain, positive lines so we could see, and they had an effect. Hearts were moved, as the scripture says, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. But brethren, has the breeze slackened up? What now? If our impressions, our sense of need, our earnestness is not found deeper, brethren, as these meetings go on, then there is something the matter with each one of us. I'm not talking about us as a whole class merely in a general way. The only way we can get at this is each one individually for himself. If I'm not doing that, if you are not doing that, there is something wrong. Now, brethren, another thought. We have been obliged by the Spirit of God. We have been obliged to look at the workings of the carnal mind and what it will do for man and how it will deceive him in every way. Paganism, papacy, and the image of the papacy, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. We have seen it, and the Lord means a lesson in it to us. Now, as we have seen it, brethren, let just let each one of us let go all holds, let the soul drop right out of everything into just that childlike readiness to receive what God has to give. Congregation says amen. Let the searching of heart go one, and the confession of sin, I think he means go on, and the confession of sin. Did not Jesus say to us, be zealous, therefore, and repent? Be zealous, therefore, and repent. What does that therefore mean? For this reason, for these reasons, let us see what he said before that. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would, thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased in good and if, uh, increased in goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art regis, regis, wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. How much does that therefore cover? All of it? Congregation, yes, sir. The first thing he says is, I know thy works, and the last, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Repent. Are you ready to repent of your works now? Are you? Are you ready to admit that your works that you have done are not as good as Jesus Christ would have done them if he had been here himself and done them instead of you? Voice, yes, a thousand times. Good. How much good are these works going to do you? Are they perfect? Are they righteous works? Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Are there or have there been any works about you that have not been of faith that have said that have, have said, that have had self in them? Do not forget that garment that we are to buy, that garment woven in the loom of heaven and not one thread of human invention in it. And if you and I have stuck up a single thread of our invention in that life that we have professed to be living in Christ, we have spoiled the garment. Brethren, do you suppose you and I have gone on these 15 or 20 years so absolutely perfect that we um, absolutely perfect that we have never got a thread of human invention into our character by our deeds? Congregation, no. Then we can repent of that, can't we? Congregation, yes. I simply call attention to that, that part tonight. And now for the few minutes that remain, let us read a few passages of scripture. Isaiah 59, verse 6. Now, what chapter does this 59th uh, chapter follow? Okay, so that's pretty obvious, the 58th. And where does the 58th chapter apply? Congregation, it applies now. Now, the 58th chapter, of course, cry, um, cry loud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. 
um, Isaiah 58. So if we go, I just want to point you there. All right, so Isaiah 58. Now, why is he saying Isaiah 58 applies now? Why are people agreeing with that? We should know this chapter. It's about uh, why do you fast for debate, to smite with the fist of wickedness? And then it talks about the true fast. Is this something that applies now? Most certainly. So if you did say it applies now. So the true fast, right? Yeah. The true fast. The true yeah. fast. Well, this yeah, message, yeah. this message to, to, to distinguish between the fast that man does to um, for strife and debate, right? So, I mean, I'll read this here. I know he's going to go through it as well. But let's just read it. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice, and they take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast, ye find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free? that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rearward. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord will answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee, with the heritage of Jacob, thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So it's a very, very powerful chapter. And it, and it shows us our spiritual condition just as much as Revelation chapter three, dealing with the Laodicean message. <clears throat> so 
their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity and the act of violence is in their hands, right? So these are, are the people uh, going to be talked about. So I'll take the share button here. Um, then what has that people been trying to do? What has that people been trying to do with their works? Congregation, cover themselves with their works. When he says they shall not cover themselves with their works, that shows on the face of it that they have been trying to cover themselves with their works. Now, does he tell the truth? Congregation, yes. Then when he says to you and me, that we have been trying to cover ourselves with our works, then does not he say in that, that we have been really, whatever we profess, trusting in righteousness or justification by works? Congregation, yes. Then is not that what the Laodicean message says? I know thy works. And what have our works done for us? Made us wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? And what does he want us to have? White raiment, that thou sayest, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. What is our condition? You know well enough that our efforts at that, at that have not accomplished much. Everyone has tried to do his very best. You know yourself that it was the most discouraging thing that you ever tried to do in this world. You know yourself that you have actually sat down and cried because you could not do well enough to risk the judgment. Boys, could not do well enough to satisfy ourselves. No, we ourselves are able to see our nakedness when we had tried our best to cover ourselves. Right, so that means in order to cover ourselves, we must have seen our nakedness, right? At least that. Right. So if we're trying to cover ourselves, when somebody's trying to justify himself, he must at least see his spiritual condition to some degree, correct? Yeah, some in some way. Yeah. They may not want to be wanting to acknowledge it, but they must see it on some level or they wouldn't be trying to cover it up. You know that is so. Now, brethren, the Lord said so, didn't he? Congregation, yes, sir. Is it not time that we said, Lord, that is so? I quote it. Neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Now, the Lord wants us to be covered. He wants us to be covered so that the shame of our nakedness shall not appear. He wants us to have his perfect righteousness according to his own perfect idea of righteousness. He wants us to have that character that will stand the test of the judgment without a hitch or a question or a doubt. Let us accept it from him as the free blessed gift it is. Now, brethren, in the next lesson, my thought is now that we will enter directly upon the direct, straightforward scripture, exactly what it says to you and me as to how we can have Jesus Christ and all his righteousness, and everything that he has, without a particle of discount. What do you say, congregation? Amen. So we're going to continue on this into the next sermon. Now, <clears throat> I mean, Jones has been pretty direct. I, mean, I know sometimes it's a bit hard with Jones because he, he sometimes overstates his case. He, he, he builds it up and then... When he presents it, you should be able to see what he's saying. It shouldn't be too difficult. Um, so he says, we shall begin tonight just where we stopped the other evening with the thought that was before us that we would not, that we would now proceed to study this subject as it is in the Bible. It could take the time, I could take the time and read it all from the testimonies and steps to Christ. I could preach from them as well as from the Bible on this. But I find this difficulty. The brethren seem so ready to be content with what we read in these and will not go to the Bible to find it there. That is what the testimonies and steps to Christ are for. They are to lead us to see that it is in the Bible and to get it there. 
Now I shall avoid these purposefully, purposely, not as though there was anything wrong in using them. But what we want, brethren, is to get at it in the Bible and know where it is, know where it is there. And that is the Lord's own way as pointed out in the testimonies. Let me read it here. The word of God is sufficient to enlighten the most beclouded mind and may be understood by those who have any desire to understand it. But notwithstanding all this, some who profess to make the word of God their study are found living in direct opposition to its plain teachings. Then to leave men and women without excuse, God gives plain and pointed testimonies, bringing them back to the word that they have neglected to follow. The word of God abounds in general principles for the formation of correct habits of living. And the testimonies, general and personal, have been calculated to call their attention more especially to these principles. You are not familiar with the scriptures. If you, have, if you had made God's word your study with a desire to reach the Bible standard and attain to Christian perfection, you would, you would not have needed the testimonies. It is because you have neglected to acquaint yourself with God's inspired book that he has sought to reach you by simple direct testimonies calling your attention to the word of inspiration which you have neglected to obey. Additional truth is not brought out, but God has, through his testimonies, simplified the great truths already given and in his chosen way brought them before the people to awaken and impress the mind with them, that they may be without excuse. The tennis testimonies are not to belittle the word of God, but to exalt it and attract minds to it, that the beautiful simplicity of truth may impress all. But Jones goes on, he says, there's another reason also why we want to get this and see that it is in the Bible. That is because we, from this institute and this conference, are to go forth to preach nothing else but this just, just this one thing. And we are to preach to people who do not believe the testimonies. And the scriptures have told us that prophesying's are not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Tongues are assigned to them that believe not. Prophesying are assigned to them that believe. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Now, when we go and preach this message to people who do not know anything about the testimonies, we have to teach them that the Bible says it. And we have to teach from that alone. If we are preaching to our own people to use the testimonies and all these other helps, would be all well enough. But even then, if their minds were turned to these and not brought by these to the Bible itself, then that use of the testimonies is not what is intended by the Lord as the right use of the testimonies. Now, I've seen the same thing working another way. There is that book that a great many make a great deal of, The Christian Secret to a Happy Life. So this is a, a book that was popular at that time. I've seen people who read that book and got a considerable good out of it, as they thought, and what was for them great light, encouragement, and good. But even then, they could not go to the Bible and get it. Brethren, I want every one of you to understand that there is more of the Christian's secret of a happy life in the Bible than in 10,000 volumes of that book. Congregation, amen. I did not see that book for a long time. I think it was about five or six years ago when I first saw it. And somebody had it and was reading it and asked me if I had seen it. I said, no. I was asked if I would read it. I said, yes, I will read it. And I did. But when I did read it, I knew that I had already got more of the Christian secret of a happy life out of the Bible that there is in the book to begin with. I found that I got more of the Christian secret to a happy life in the Bible than she has in that book. I wish people would learn to get out of the Bible what is in it direct congregation amen if that book's help book helps people to get that secret in the bible with a good deal more of it all right but i knew that book has nothing like the christian secret of a happy life that everyone can get in the bible well i did hear once i did get the news once that i got my light out of that book 
there's a book where I got my Christian secret of a happy life, holding up the Bible. And that is the only place. And I had it before I ever saw the other book or knew it was in existence. And I say again, when I came to read the other, I knew that I had more of a Christian secret of a happy life than there is in that book to begin with. And so will everyone else who will read the Bible and believe it. But does anybody know who wrote that book, The Christian Secret of a Happy Life? Anybody know offhand? I can look it up. I've heard of it. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's written by a Quaker, but I can't remember her name. I think it's Hannah, somebody or other. Quaker? I haven't read it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Uh, Hannah Whittle Smith. Okay. Um, so this is about seeing God in all the circumstances. I, yeah. So anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah. So it's H.W. Uh, Smith or Hannah Whittle Smith. So I don't know anything about her. You, the Quaker or something you're saying and and there's something to that the idea i guess the gist of the book according to what i'm seeing here on the internet is that it's it's seeing god in all the circumstances of life and of course uh, any christian should see that god god's hand in the things that have happened to them and how god works and operates right that would be uh, and that would be a, a good thing to know i mean if you thought that everything was happening to you was, you know, Satan having power over you. If you thought everything that bad happened to you was somehow Satan, uh, what would you think about God's power? Because you're a Christian following God and, and bad things are happening to you. I know Christians who think this. Every time something bad happens, it's Satan. Can't we see that God is more powerful than Satan? So something bad happens to me. How come it's happened to me? Has God allowed it to happen? Oh, man. Okay. Oh. Yeah, so if I know that God has allowed it to happen, then I can be happy the, about it, right? That's why I can rejoice in tribulation. Because I know that God has allowed it to happen. And he's allowed it to happen for my good and the good of those around me. Because is God going to allow something to happen that's not to my good? No. So I can rejoice in all things, even though they're painful, even though they're a trial, even though sometimes I come up to a wall of discouragement, I can know that it came from God and I can rejoice in the light of that knowledge. And that's, that's a, to me, a very uh, fundamental truth. That every Christian should know. But that's not all there is in the Bible, right? As Jones is saying. <clears throat> so, and Jones saying he didn't get his light from, from that book. He had never read it. He got it from the Bible. A Christian mysticism. She became a Christian universalist. So, so here you can see... Um, that you can take some truth, right? And this is the thing that I have found about Christianity, the so-called Christian world, because I was a Christian before I was an Adventist. What happens if you take a truth? It can be a truth from scripture and you make it the truth. What happens when you do that? Can you take a truth of the Bible and take it out of the Bible and divorce it from all of the other truths of God's word? No. 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 Thinking of Miller's rules. 
Right, because it's it's no longer truth anymore when it's taken out of its context, is it? And and these can be very true things, right? So I think it's a fundamental idea to see. And I didn't read the book, but you know, there's Christian mysticism there. And there's probably a lot of fantasy and imaginings about things, probably all kinds of different exercises that you need to do to somehow experience this happiness. And I'm just guessing, I haven't read it, but I've read a lot of books like that. They provide a secret, some truth from scriptures taken out of its context that can make us feel like we're close with God or that God is blessing us or whatever. But aren't these just lies? Because somebody can say, well, I can see God's hand in everything. And and yet they're not obeying, obeying God in any way whatsoever. Right? That, that the consequences of their own actions, they can attribute to God. That this is somehow God's blessing. But they're not re- reformed by these things. Correct? Have you ever seen that before? Yes, I've seen it. Yeah. They bring their trials upon them. So, you know, they they don't work or they don't put any effort into anything. Uh, they walk around reading the Bible, talking about the Bible. But the work that God has given to them to do, they neglect. And then when bad things happen, like they get expelled from their house or, um, you know, they're living in poverty. They take it, well, this is just a trial that came from God's hand. But yet, yeah, that, that trial came more from their own hand than from God, didn't it? Choices we make, too. So, so even though there is a truth that God foresees everything and he allows things to happen in our lives that come from him, that truth taken out of the context of obedience to God out of God's word can be a deception. And that's how Satan works his deceptions, right? We've talked about this many times. He takes a truth, he mixes it with error, or even just takes it out of the context, divorces it from the truths of God's word that are complementary, that are needed in order to understand that one truth. And it becomes a whole doctrine in and of itself. I've seen that happen many, many times with many people, Adventists included. That in one that we're talking about here, just the idea of justification. You take justification by itself, divorce it from justification and judgment or sanctification and judgment. Justification becomes what? A self-delusion, doesn't it? A satanic delusion. Well, Satan, Satan was self-righteous. <laughs> yeah. So Joan says, now I want to ask a few questions on what we have gone over. So he's going to do a little bit of a review before he gets into some of these things. He says, what is the latter rain? The congregation, the teaching of righteousness according to righteousness. What is the loud cry? Congregation, the message of the righteousness of Christ. The loud cry has already begun in the message of the righteousness of Christ. Where does the latter rain come from? Congregation from God. All of it? Congregation. Yes. What is it? Congregation, the spirit of God. Now, let us just put two things together. The teaching of righteousness, according to righteousness, the message of righteousness. That is the loud cry. That is the latter rain. That is the righteousness of Christ. Is that so? Congregation, yes. Uh, The latter rain comes down from heaven. How much of that latter rain comes out of me? Congregation, none of it. How much of it can I manufacture? Congregation, not any. Now, is that so? Congregation, yes. I cannot manufacture any of it. None of it springs from me at all. Where does it come from? Congregation, heaven. Will you take it that way? Will you receive it from heaven? Congregation, yes. Now, that is where we came to the other night. Are you ready to take it from heaven? Congregation, yes. Is everybody in this house tonight willing 
and ready to take righteousness from heaven. Congregation, amen. According to God, without asking that God shall get some of it from us, are you? Congregation, yes. Whoever is willing to take righteousness from heaven can receive the latter rain. Congregation, amen. Whoever is not, but wants the Lord to get some of it out of him, he cannot have the latter rain. He cannot have the righteousness of God. He cannot have the message of the righteousness of Christ. What is the latter rain? Congregation, righteousness. Are we in the time of the latter rain? Congregation, yes. And what are we to ask for? Congregation, rain. And what is it? The teaching of righteousness according to righteousness. And where is it come from? Where does it come from? Heaven. Can we have it? Yes. Can we have it now? Yes. Then the latter rain, being the righteousness of God, his message of righteousness, the loud cry, it all being that, and that to come down from heaven, we are now in the time of it. We are to ask for it and receive it. Then what is to hinder us from receiving the latter rain now? congregation unbelief i will read a passage from this little book to start with we have read it once before it is found on page eight on, of danger of adopting worldly policies so uh, we, if you remember reading that um so as man's intercessor and advocate jesus will lead all who are willing to be led saying, follow me upward, step by step, where the clear light of the Son of Righteousness shines. But not all are following the light. Some are moving away from the safe path, which at every step is a path of humility. God has committed his servants a message for this time. I, I would not now rehearse before you the evidences given in the past two years. So this would be four years now. Of the dealing, so God by his chosen servants, of the dealing so by God, dealing so God by his cho chosen servants, of the dealing of God by his chosen servants. I think there's some word missing there or something. But the present evidence of his working is revealed to you, and you now are, are now under obligation to believe. So Jones asks, believe what? What message is there referred to that God has given his servants for this time? Congregation, the message of righteousness. The message of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. This is a testimony that had been despised, rejected, and criticized for two years. And two years have passed since that time. But now the present evidence of his working is revealed. And now what does God say to every one of us? You are now under obligation to believe that message, then whoever does not believe it simply has to answer to God, does he not? That is all. Well, then, let us begin. Uh, there is, however, another word to which I wish to call attention. You remember what I had read in Isaiah 59, verse 6 in the last lesson. It was about those people who are trying to cover themselves with their works. In the fourth verse, we have these words, none calleth for justice. After the lesson, Brother Starr called my attention to the German translation, and that, he says, is, none preacheth righteousness. I looked at the revised version, and that has it, none sueth for righteousness, or the margin, none calleth for righteousness. I looked at Young's literal translation, and that likewise reads, none calleth for righteousness. So you see the thought as expressed in this verse, none sueth, that is to say, to court, to ask for, to beseech. For righteousness. None calleth for that. The same idea is conveyed in the German, only it is put in other words. None preacheth righteousness. Well, is not that what the Lord says? They are trying to cover themselves with their works, and that is not righteousness. Isaiah 54, last sentence of the chapter, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, said the Lord. Their righteousness is of whom? of themselves, congregation, of the Lord. Their righteousness is of their works? No, their righteousness is of me, said the Lord. What do you say, congregation, of the Lord? 
Their righteousness is of their works? No, the righteousness is of me, said the Lord. What do you say, congregation? Amen. Then any man who expects, looks for, or hopes for any righteousness that does not come from God, what then? What has he? Voice, filthy rags. It is no righteousness at all. Even those who want to get it out of their own works, will it work that way? Congregation, no. Is that of God? Congregation, no, sir. The only way that God can get into our works is by having him to start with and having his righteousness to begin with. And our only ground of hope is in the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and in that wrought in us by his Holy Spirit. This takes up the subject exactly where Brother Prescott stopped. Do you see it as Christ in us, that living presence that does the righteous work? And that is by the Holy Spirit. That is what the Holy Spirit brings. That is the outpouring of the latter rain, is it not? You see, we cannot study anything else. That is the message for us now. Shall we receive the message? When we receive the message, what do we receive? Congregation, Christ. When we receive him, what have we? Voice, the Holy Spirit, the latter rain. This will come more fully afterward. Now, I just want to address one point here. So when Joan says, we cannot study anything else, is he excluding prophecy? Is he saying that we just need to study the righteousness of Christ? We shouldn't be interested in prophecy. Does he say that anywhere? Is that implied by what he's saying? No, I don't think so. No. So if our message is the righteousness of Christ, and we are to preach prophecy, is prophecy the righteousness of Christ? Well, at least in part. Well, I would say even more than just in part, right? So remember, we, we talked before about um, the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, right? When Jesus was resurrected from the dead and he's on the road to Emmaus, what did he show them? From where did he bring the evidence? Was it not from the law and the prophets? Everything concerning himself? Does that include prophecy? Could you pro possibly preach the righteousness of Christ without prophecy? No, you can't. No, you can't. You can try, but what it will be is impotent. It will have no power in it. Can we believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is without prophecy? Absolutely no. not. No, we can't. He's told us these things. <laughs> Look at Revelation. Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Is it a, is it a revelation of the righteousness of Christ? It has to be a revelation of the righteousness of Christ. Now, is the book of Revelation a book of prophecy? No, no. Yeah. Definitely. There's no way you could read it and not believe it's a book of prophecy. But it is a revelation of Christ. It is the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. So what I've seen is there are people who want to talk about the righteousness of Christ, but they don't want prophecy. I mean, they'll give a little bit of prophecy here and there, but it's not going to be the powerful prophecy 
that's going to bring that strong conviction. It's not going to give us strength and faith. Prophecy, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Is the word of God prophecy? Isn't really the Bible prophecy all the way through? Isn't every story, every incident, every symbol, all prophecy? Isn't it all the righteousness of Christ? Isn't every, in every word of scripture written the righteousness of Christ, the character of God? Yeah. Yeah. Now, when he says, you know, that we're not supposed to study anything else, that we're not going to give any other message than the righteousness of Christ. Is it possible for somebody to preach from the Bible and it to be devoid of the spirit of God, devoid of the righteousness of Christ? Are there not people who preach from the Bible, but they take Christ out of it? Yep. You know, a good example would be Dwight Nelson. You know, sometimes some people have him as a favorite speaker. I've watched a lot of his sermons because he used to have uh, 3ABN. And the one thing I could tell is that, you know, he wasn't preaching the gospel. I mean, it's pretty obvious right from the beginning. But many Adventists think that he's preaching the gospel. Now, why do they think that? I mean, I'm not a judge of Dwight Nelson, but all I can tell you about his preaching is it's devoid of the spirit of Christ. But why do people think that it's, it's not. Doesn't that type of preaching appeal to human nature? Do you understand? It, it, it appeals to some of the worst portions of human nature. Right. It makes people feel that they are righteous, that they are better than others. And any preaching that doesn't convict the listener is devoid of the spirit of Christ. You can tell stories. You can tell all of these anecdotes. You can refer to the Bible. You can sort of be trying to encourage people to, uh, to accomplish God's work. But without the spirit of Christ, there's no conviction, no conviction of sin. You might be motivated, you might be manipulated to act and behave in a certain way, but that's not the spirit of Christ, is it? It's actually a spirit of bondage. Many Adventists are in a spirit of bondage. Everything that they do, they do because they're manipulated to do it. They have guilt, they have fear, they have peer pressure. All of these things are the things that motivate them to act. But when you have the spirit of Christ, you have a freedom. But there's also a burning conviction. That you see that you are not who you imagine yourself to be. So Jones is going to be showing this from the scriptures. This very thing that he's been presenting here from the spirit of prophecy, from Steps to Christ and other books. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we have been manipulated. We have, we have believed that what we're teaching is righteousness by faith. And, and there are many, many different teachings that go under that heading in Adventism but they're devoid of the spirit of Christ. And this movement has this opportunity to take up this work that was abandoned in 1893.
because we're repeating this history. And we have this opportunity now to be transformed, to be changed. And that means we're going to have to recognize that what Christ says about us is true. But what he says about someone else, because he says it about us. And then this, the work that he's going to do is going to be of him, not of us. But it is work that we are going to do. God is going to work in us and through us. His righteousness. It's going to be him taking the work into his own hands. But is it going to be wrought through our hands? Is God going to use us? Are we going to be his instruments? Isn't that what we've been praying for? At least I know I've been praying for that for 40 years. Since I became an Adventist, praying for the latter rain, praying for the teacher of righteousness according to righteousness, to have Christ live in me and do his work through me, just as he will every other person who submits to him. This is the message that we are to give. And that message is bound up in everything that God has given this movement. Every prophecy, every symbol, every experience that we have been through. This is the work of the Holy Spirit being accomplished by God in those that will receive his spirit. So we're going to close with prayer. Um, anybody have anything, final things to say on this point, what we've studied? I'm sure Dwight will have some things to say tomorrow morning as he shares the spirit of prophecy with us in the Bible. Let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful. We pray, Lord, that you can use us. We know we are unworthy, that we are sinners, that we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and make, naked, and we do not know it. We just accept that it is true based upon your word. Help us to come close to you, to see our sins, to submit to you, to allow you to use us, to give our will to you, to not trust in our own thoughts, our own reasons, our own doings, but to trust wholly in thee. Be with each person, we pray. Be with us throughout this Sabbath, the meetings tomorrow, and the meetings on Sunday as well and throughout this week. And we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.